Okay, can everybody hear me? And if you can't, um, please say something either in the chat channel for this for the arena or in the big top. Um, I'm just, I appreciate that. Um, I am making sure that I am making sure that the bot me six that does the audio recording is working properly. And I guess then, yeah, we're good to go then. Um, so I think the, um, the first thing I guess I should talk about is I should talk about the planned phases of PyroSwap. Um, I'm assuming that's what everybody wants to ask about. And, and I see that Flawless Noob wrote questions earlier today. Please share timeline for launch, key milestones. Is there any support you require from the community? Okay, what a great question. What, what, all three of these are great questions. Please share the timeline for the launch. Now, for those of you who aren't aware, we're like, I don't know, 120% behind schedule right now. And um, it's, uh, it's been that way for a, I guess, a series of blindsided delays, but we're in fact extremely close to the finish line now. Um, arguably, the thing that I would mention is within DeFi and with, within, the, within the environment where most projects are effectively just forks launched from each other, um, I think there is this level of expectation that spinning up one of these projects should take less than five days, right? Um, I'm pretty sure you guys have all seen, um, I think when maybe a chain like Doge was launching, that people were spinning up DEXs on Doge in like 36 hours or less, right? Um, mainly because they were just doing a copy and paste fork of an already existing DEX and they weren't building anything proprietary, if that makes sense. They were just doing the most simplistic of forks. And if this project were the same as that, I would agree that this timeline is pretty egregious. But if you want to understand why DeFi is filled with Ponzi schemes and the projects that are not Ponzi schemes are that much more rare, it is because, in fact, building something that is not a Ponzi scheme is at least five to 10 times as hard as launching a Ponzi scheme. Does that make sense? Like you have to account for, you have to account for an entire level of Zoom that I think most Ponzi nomical um, projects don't at all. They don't think about the actual design of a financial instrument. They don't think about the actual design of a market for it, right? And because of this, because of this, I think investor expectations around the timelines of these things are biased towards them being quick to spin up. Um, there is an advantage to doing that, but I don't feel like that served us at all. And had we, had we launched this project in April when we first intended to, we would have gotten blindsided by the multi-chain fiasco. And on top of that, we would have allowed two different devs that were involved in rug pulling to effectively benefit from our ecosystem. And these three scenarios that we dodged are kind of um, to our benefit. So to answer your actual question, what is the timeline to launch, right? That's really what the, the nuts and bolts of this is. The timeline to launch is in the matter of weeks right now. In fact, in August, in late August internally, we believed that a mid-September um, closed beta launch was extremely feasible. And it's possible that a late September closed beta launch is still feasible. That does not really mean that this is something that you will see. Closed beta, to, uh, to reiterate, closed beta is probably about 7 to 14 days of us just testing the mechanics of PyroSwap internally and making sure that they function and making sure that the, the dashboards that we built earlier in 2023, making sure that they are correctly displaying what they should be displaying based on the fact that they're meant to help 
the investor understand what terminal, terminal utility is doing to the, to the tokenomics. And um, so as far as that goes, I could tell you that you can expect an open beta in October, but at the same time, I want to be very, very clear. If the developers who work here in the circus, if the developers do not want to launch in October, like I'm going to defer to them and not the investors. And that is annoying for me as well. Okay. Um, I believe back in June, people were already, people were already in general chats saying things like I'll expect it in November. Right. So the last thing I want to do is prove those people correct. That said that we weren't going to launch until November. (laughs) But again, I will still uh, defer to the professional opinions of our development department uh, as opposed to just the shit talking of the investors in general chat. Does that make sense? I hope that makes sense to you guys. Um, Okay. I see some typing. I can wait for that or I can answer the next question I saw. Um, Okay. Oh, key milestones. Okay. Key milestones. I'll write them out. Key milestones. Key milestones. Um, okay, by the way, do you guys know? I will say this. Everything, uh, no, no, Mr. Ertan MS. We are not going to launch the beta this week. Um, I will let you know this. Everything on testnet looks like it works. So I want you to understand that pretty much the entirety of this has already been deployed on testnet. And everything as it functions on testnet works. And what you can take away from that is that there is likely a 99% chance that it will work on a regular net as well. Um, I don't have any sort of fantasies about investor behavior in DeFi. So I want to be clear, this does not require altruism on anybody's behalf. I expect that all 15,000 investors or however many more, however many investors there are, oh, there's going to be a closed beta and then an open beta. There will be a closed beta that will be probably about a week Maybe, maybe two weeks at most, and then that will transition directly into open beta. And I will make announcements when we're in open beta. I will, I will be publishing videos and, doing, um, and writing more documentation tutorials as well because there, is a, uh, there, is, there are layers to how to interact with PyroSwap. There are layers to it. Let's put it that way, difficulty layers. And there are layers of strategies where you as an investor can figure out how to affect the performance of your own bag. So uh, I'm going to talk about more of that a little later in this AMA. I'm going to talk about why we're calling PyreSwap the first decentralized credit union as well, because that is actually a pretty big deal. Um, But I will answer, let's see, this next question here was, yeah, I know, I know, grow a grid. But then then I really, really hope... (laughs) Yeah, w- way to be alpha. Uh, you're correct. You're correct. Um, but I really wanted to get it in like April, May, June. You know what I mean? I wanted to make it happen every single month. And I want you to know that um, I, I was mentored in my past as an entrepreneur. I was mentored by, uh, by, my, um, by my state general agent when I was an insurance salesman in my 20s, okay? And when I was in my insurance salesman, that's when I really learned about financial instruments for the first time. And my, my mentor, my boss, he told me that whenever you're about to do something that is truly great, you can expect the universe to really hit you with a tidal wave of adversity. Like you should expect the entire world to be fighting against you in your pursuit of this. So I think that is why PyroSwap will get to the finish line because I am not going... I will die before PyreSwap like doesn't do its job. Does that make sense? Like I will, I will, my, I give my life to this. I do not gain my life from this. Does that make sense? I give my life to this. I do not gain my life from this. However, this will be the most vindicating moment in my fucking life. I'm pretty sure this will be the biggest moment of vindication uh, in the entire time that I spend alive as a Homo sapien because I took a year and a half bet on some theoretics that I threw together in the middle of 2022. And I kept looking at it and I kept looking at it and I started designing from those theoretics 
I had to design dashboards so other people could look at what I look at. And um, well, grow a grid. I want you to know that October is possibly more realistic than November. But at the same time, I'm not going to put that on the sh uh, the shoulders of my devs because I have to be grateful for them doing what they've done for us so far. They're doing it for their own bag, but they're doing it for my bag and they're doing it for your bag as well. Uh, they're doing it for the sake of actually making DeFi a little bit less embarrassing. That's really the way that I look at it. Like we need to make DeFi less embarrassing because some of the stuff that I see people doing from, from Fi's perspective, it is, an, it is an embarrassment that we don't know how to make financial instruments and how to make things work here because there is centuries of history around that in, in regular TradFi. There's centuries of history about that. And like nobody's looking at, oh, hey, this is what you need to do to make a financial instrument function. You know, when we talk about terminal utility and we talk about utility of these coins, first of all, let's be realistic. 97% of people in DeFi want return on investment. And the reason they want return on investment is not necessarily because they're greed. It's because right now their, their investment took a hit. Does that make sense? Some people want to just break even, you know? And the fact of the matter is, is, People don't want to experiment in DeFi, whether it be for financial reasons or uh, ideological reasons, and then take a loss. Does that make sense? Like, if you want to experiment in DeFi, like, it shouldn't be like, oh, you lost 99% of your experimental money. Does that make sense? Like, all the time. Because that's how, that's how these things seem to manifest. Like, even if somebody just wants to learn about what the economic revolution that will be driven by this technology would look like, they end up just getting wrecked for 99% of their position every single time. And it's just, it's just, that's embarrassing. And it's not that people shouldn't take losses because, you know, I think losses help you understand markets better and they kind of help you gain a better level of self-control over your own emotions and your own maturity. But at the same time, like these don't need to be robbery by calculus because a lot of these DeFi projects are robbery by calculus. That's effectively what's happening. People don't realize that's what that is. Basically, by reinventing the pump and dump 17 different ways. The best thing about Tomb Forks, by the way, the best thing about Tomb Forks is they showed that people figured out how to make money aside from just swing trading. And that was the function of the boardroom, right? You could collect prints. And this was uh, even Olympus Dow and Titano, arguably, um, you know, brought in the concept of APR and liquidity, liquidity providing too. But anything that you can design, um, there are more ways to build financial instruments in DeFi using utilities. There are more of them and you will see them in PyreSwap. So in PyreSwap, we arguably built two more, right? That's by the way, just in beta, just in beta, you'll see that there's two more financial instruments. And one of them is called the Incantation Witch Vault. And another one is called Metatrage. And these are, these, are effectively, um, these are effectively different variations of financial instruments. And there are ways that you can use these coins to make money that isn't just nonsensically pumping and dumping on top of the guy next to you. And um, we, will, we will get more and more into that detail later. I'm going to answer a few questions that I skipped. Key milestones, okay? First of all, testnet, testnet um, proves... Efficacy. And by the way, this is done. This is done. So that's done. Two, we're going to be at closed beta and we're not here yet. Then we're going to be at open beta. And then this is basically four. And this is phase one of PyreSwap is in effect. Okay. So there are actually five planned phases of PyroSwap. I want you guys to know that just what you've seen on the Revelation Tour or what you've seen in other documents or other presentations I've done, uh, that's, that is still just a glimpse. So there are, in fact, five phases of PyroSwap. And um, here, I'll, I'll do that as well. Phase one is basically proving to you Proving to you, literally proving Phythianism, proving Phythianism as a design approach in DeFi. By the way, for those of you who know about my 
tokenomics course in presale, uh, that will involve, that will include a lot of the um, design principles of Fivianism, which by the way, look like they're more and more valuable day by day. But again, I'll let the numbers speak for themselves. Like I don't need to continue shilling my stuff ahead of time. I'll let you guys see that in real life. And then you can determine whether or not you think Fivianism is the, the better school of thinking in DeFi. Um, and then of course, decentralized aggregate credit union. Then we're do, doing phase two, which is solving the liquidity problem caused by phase one with farms and other things. More GameFi elements. Uh, Professor Fi's liquidity dashboard. And this is, for those of you who don't know, liquidity vertex. Okay. Phase three, this involves events. Events um, that, that continue to create TU for the coins, for the peg coins. Um, additionally, I think in phase three, um, oh, phase three, possibly, yeah, possibly more chains, more chains added to PyroSwap. Phase four, these are um, more events. Yeah, more complicated events. Phase five is in fact decentralized individual Okay. okay, that's a pretty good breakdown, okay? Um, so I am going to, let me see, those were the key milestones. And of course, is there any support you require from the community? What a great question. So believe it or not, I do not plan on fixing these projects out of altruism. Does that make sense? I'm gonna make that real clear and I'm gonna write that down as well. I never believed in betting on the altruism of DeFi investors who use their pseudonymity to act to act like fucking marmosets. Okay, here if you want the quote of this AMA, it's that I never believed in betting on the altruism of DeFi investors who use their pseudonymity to act like fucking marmosets. So those of you who don't know, pseudonymity means using your false name, using an alias, uh, not being doxxed. Yeah, um, you know, for, uh, phase five is clearly going to be a 2024 thing for sure. But yeah, um, as far as my own vindication, um, the circus does now get to declare that the circus invented the decentralized credit union. And I'm going to explain more and more about what that means in phase one and throughout these five phases of PyreSwap. But literally, we have, in fact, um, all of the peg coins that you know. So let's say Divs, let's say Tuom, let's say Frozen Tomb, let's say everybody knows these three, right? These three instruments are, in fact, a credit limit. They are, in fact, a credit volume is the best way to think about it. Um, and you might be saying, what do you mean, right? Like, I, I don't know what you're talking about, and I've only understood them to be a peg coin, and I collect prints from it. Yes, and for those of you who don't know, and I know a few of you do remember me talking about this all the time, is what was obvious to me when I first got into Tomb Finance, the original, the original Tomb Finance, as well as um, all of its forks in early 2022, and actually late 21 even, but this, this was designed by Robert Sams and even the people who kind of took this ideology and they were trying to create the debt cycle. This is what they're trying to do. So for here, an example, an example on the one on the bottom right, the green line, the green line ought to represent the growth of the phantom opera ecosystem as a whole. And then the blue line ought to 
represent the actual price action of phantom and then the red line ought to represent the actual price action of peg coins that target phantom like tomb two ohm three ohm etc this is this is how this ought to work does that make sense like this is what this is what ideologically was trying to be created but i don't think it, it, okay, with the exception of maybe, let's see, in my audience, let's see, we've got, I would say maybe three or four people who I know has, have heard of it before. Um, nobody had heard of the debt cycle before. Like nobody had heard of the Austrian business cycle or any type of general economic cycle. And it, it, uh, I, I made an egregious error in thinking that what was obvious to me was obvious to other people. And I didn't realize how not obvious it was because this was like first time I'm reading the tomb finance docs, probably in September of 2021. So probably two years ago, I'm reading the documentation of tomb finance for the first time. And I'm like, Oh, I get it. It's the debt cycle, but it's in phantom. How fucking cool is that? I don't think anybody cared about that besides me. Like maybe I don't know, 10 people did. I don't, they're probably in this fucking audience. Um, but the point being, is this was the, this was the operational goal. So I realized that the way to make this work is you have to build something in order to get it to behave like this. So for those of you who don't know, we had to create terminal utility for the peg coins. And the reason we did that is because we needed the peg coins to get back above um, their target, right? The the bonds, the bonds as they were, here I can paste another image as well. The bonds as they were, were not strong enough. Here, I'll show you this. This right here is an image I'm posting in the big top, this last, the last image right there. Um, I hope it makes sense to all of you, but this is why terminal utility continues to be such a big deal and why I keep talking about it and thumping it as if it is my Bible. Because if you look at the, if you look at the, um, the matrix there on the left, you'll notice that there is nothing that is a permanent contraction mechanism. Like there isn't anything there. And the reason being is because you can't, you can't build an economy out of any, um, out of not having some type of counterweight or gravitational anchor or some type of other value, some type of other, other economic value. Like you can't, if you, have, if you have a coin just for the sake of a coin, all you have is a worthless security. Like all you have is effectively a, uh, a beach, a, a, a balloon. You have a balloon and everybody's just, tapping this balloon up in the air and eventually this balloon will pop or it'll crash to the ground and you don't want to be playing. I'm not going to use allegories forever here. I'm going to keep, I'm going to keep answering the questions. Okay. Is there any support you require from the community? Believe it or not, here is the great news. This effort does not require 15,000 investors to believe in me. This requires probably a few dozen investors to actually figure out uh, how the terminal utilities work. And the reason these work is because we're relying on the curvature of the constant product formula, meaning we're relying on the curvature of the hyperbola. And in DeFi, a lot of people don't like the curvature of the CPF, but believe it or not, it is through that curvature that you're actually able to create non-zero uh, value creation. You're, you're, out, you're, allowed to, you're allowed to make that uh, non-zero sum value creation. And what I mean by this, what I mean by this is that basically every single thing that is required of DeFi investors is profitable or potentially profitable. So the reason that there are dashboards is so it can be easier for, for the investors to figure out when these windows of profitability will show up. So as far as like what the investor participation is, it requires gas. 
It literally only requires gas and whatever your bag already is. So if you hold the peg coin, you should be able to, in small increments, you should be able to mead and meet a trage to in fact pump the price of the peg coin while also acquiring more of it at the same time. In this scenario, in Metatrage, what you're basically beating up, what you're basically damaging in order to repair the price of the peg coin is you are damaging another coin called uh, the Pyre Gas Coin. And this coin is Pyre AVAX, Pyre BNB, or Pyre Phantom. Now, this coin will get hammered in price, uh, definitely by people being a little bit overzealous with it. It's not going to have extremely deep liquidity to start off with either. And that's okay. That's okay. Because whenever the price of Pyre Phantom or Pyre AVAX or Pyre BNB gets too low, it can actually get repaired by gassing the epoch transpiration. So if you supply gas to the epoch transpiration, the decay of Pyre Phantom will actually cause it to raise in price. As it raises in price, it eventually gets to the point where it is now profitable to do metatrage again. And what that means is that you, as a holder of the peg coin, can burn your peg coin to mint, let's say you need to burn two ohm to mint Pyre Phantom, and you can, in fact, dump Pyre Phantom to pump py, uh, two ohm. And what will effectively be the floating support line for 2 ohm, 3 ohm, and Z ohm is whatever the market price of Pyre Phantom is. So I think in the early stages, this will be a little bit confusing, but I will be an active, the circus will actively involve ourselves in doing this, but we'll also be teaching it to others as well, because the goal of this is to have the ecosystem operate decentralized. And what I mean by that is a DeFi project should not just be completely run by a dev spinning plates behind the scenes. Does that make sense? Like that's not how Bitcoin works, right? Satoshi Nakamoto isn't like manually changing difficulty every time. Um, does, does that make sense? Like the whole thing is operated by the aggregation of decentralized actors, the aggregation of activity of decentralized actors. And that's exactly the goal with this as well. So while the circus will be operating uh, parts of it for sure, it's our goal to make it as hands off as possible uh, or rather that we just cooperate it in parallel with the investors. Because what's also being used to design PyroSwap is actual game theory, right? And by actual game theory, I mean to contrast that against projects you guys might know like Olympus DAO because I don't feel like the game theory of Olympus DAO was complete. I believe that was a, um, it was erroneous. Let's put it that way. So when it comes to running credit and when it comes to running debt and when it comes to banking, banking is effectively game theory applied to the time value of money. In a nutshell, that is fundamentally what banking is. And what PyreSwap will allow the investor base to do, specifically the investors that are staked in the boardroom, is these investors will now be playing a different game in the boardroom. They will be effectively co-managing a credit union. And Dibs, and, Dibs as well, yeah. Dibs, Tuom, um, Frozen Tomb, Snow Tomb, yeah. Is that what you're asking me? Um, let me see. Okay, so... Is there any support you require from the community? I hope I answered that. And I would, I'm going to be as, uh, I'm going to start catering to my audience more in my communications, which is why, by the way, this will be a recorded AMA and it is recorded. So I will even be um, on camera doing YouTube tutorials for a lot of phase one. And we will be posting these videos on YouTube where I will be pointing stuff out and explaining to people how this works so they can better get a better grip on it. Uh, it is not that complicated. So everything about this is designed that if you could figure out how the tomb fork works, you can figure out how this works. Does that make sense? If you figured out how the boardroom works, you can figure out how the incantation witch vault works. Okay. If you figured out how bonds work, you can figure out how metatrage works. So, uh, 
seniority protocols prove that, by the way. So I, I know I just got done saying how dumb DeFi investors are, but they're not that dumb, right? Like they do figure out when they're incentivized to figure something out. So Okay, let me go back to other questions. Are you going to launch a beta? Okay, is there, is there going to be an influence over the prices due to this delay? Okay, uh, Mr. Earth and MS, great, 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 great question. Is there going to be influence over the prices due to this delay? Believe it or not, Mr. Erten, what we did because of the delay is we rapidly changed the decay rates of the pirate gas coin. So what that means there is it used to be that the gas coin was going to decay at 0.4% per epoch below 0.4. That has now been quadrupled. So that will now be at 1.6% per epoch below 0.4. Um, it was going to be, it was going to decay at 0.2. <clears throat> it was going to decay at 0.2 below 0.6 TWAP. And I believe that is now doubled to 0.4%. And I believe below 0.8, it was going to decay at 0.1. And that is now going to be at 0.2. So if you want to say, what are the things we've done to kind of um, to, to, to compensate for the delay is this. The decay rates of Pyre AVAX, Pyre BNB, and Pyre Phantom used to be, let's see, 0.4% per epoch under 0. Okay, so I just I wrote that out in the big top just now. Um, and as you can see, it used to be on a curve that would double, right? But we actually made it so that the curve would go up exponentially. Um, and by up, I mean, I guess down. But the point being there is um, the, the relationship between one, two, and four is obviously a multiplier of two. The, uh, the relationship between two, four, and 16 is a multiplication of uh, itself squared, right? So it's a it's it's squared now versus two x. And uh, the reason I chose to do it that way is because the constant product formula is in fact a hyperbola, and hyperbola uh, in hyperbola it makes more sense to do exponential math to solve the problem than it does to do multiplication. But they would both work. However, the top one would be way slower, and um, because of the delay. I uh, recognize that we could perhaps do the parts below 0.4 a little faster. Uh, additionally, by the way, the reason that we're doing below 0.4 so fast is because once we get these things up to 0.4, it's basically proven that they will get to peg as well. Does that make sense? So 0.4 is a, uh, a goal of ours across the board because 0.4 proves that this system works all the way up to peg, but all of the, all of the major gains, all of the bigger um, multiples, all of the biggest returns on investment actually take place below 0.4. Um, okay. So I hope that uh, answers your question. Is there going to be an influence over the prices due to this delay? I would say, uh, keep in mind, keep in mind, this will work at, let's see, what is the price of Phantom and BNB today? Okay. So Phantom right now is 18 or 19 cents. Um, BNB is $210. And it looks like Avalanche is $8.90 or so. Okay, C keep in mind that not only will this work at this price, but if continuing to hold, it will work again when the prices go back up to what they were in summer. Does that make sense? So if Phantom touches $2 again, it will, it will be another, uh, another 10X there, right? And if BNB touches... Now, I don't know if BNB will touch $2,000, <laughs> but um, maybe it will. Maybe it will touch $2,000. And um, that would be another 10X. Phantom, or sorry, Avalanche could definitely 10X there as well. Avalanche could even go, uh, 
from $8.90 here. Avalanche, I want to say its all-time high was something like $120. I don't remember, to be honest. It could have been higher than that. But that would be more like a, a 12X or a 14X. So maybe Avalanche right now is actually the biggest. Um, maybe Avalanche is the highest, highest, uh, highest long-term return there. Um, I, I honestly can't speak to the future prices of those gas coins. But I will let you know that higher swap being built on those chains does in fact help the ecosystems of those chains, which in turn helps the gas coins price go up, which then helps our own, our own coins prices go up. I hope that makes sense to you guys. That's a little bit harder to kind of unravel there. Um, I hope that answers your question about uh, influence over the prices. Um, is phase one going to be an issue this year? Is it guaranteed? Okay. Uh, the answer to that is yes. Like, at the, but at the same time, is it guaranteed? Fuck. I don't think anything's guaranteed. So um, I would say that the, the uh, chances of it are above 99%. Above 99%. But I would never say guaranteed. Like, I, don't, I don't think about 100% like that. But I do think 99% is, is a, it's 99% as it is uh, configured on testnet. Keep in mind, is there a 1% chance there's some weird exploit vector that we can't find on testnet? 100%. Oh, no, sorry. I don't want to say too many percentages and confuse you. Um, is there a chance that there is an exploit vector on um, some of the new pieces of, of um, infrastructure that could possibly have an exploit vector in them? Sure. But we'll be able to fix them if that happens. And it also would seem like there won't be that much money to actually exploit it for in the early stages. Does that make sense? Uh, what we're using for LP is the same as uh, SushiSwap and Uniswap. Does that make sense? So our LP contract is going to be the exact same as um, much more, um, I guess, established DEXs. The only things that are kind of unique to us are going to be the metatrage utilities, the, the meeting utilities and the incantation witch vault. So those could have exploit vectors in them, but I don't think they will either because um, they're, they're kind of built off of the uh, boardroom and the bonds of Tomb Forks. So I think most of what's been an exploit vector there before has already been kind of... And therefore, I don't think that's... Uh, well, again, it's never, it's never a 0% chance, is there? You know? Okay. I hope that answers your questions. I'm going to go back to the other chat now and see if other people wrote there and there as well. Okay, so I can go back now into uh, decentralized aggregate credit union. Do you guys have any other questions? This is about 40 minutes into this. I can just kind of explain some things if nobody else has an actual question. Oh, if you guys want to raise your hand, you can come to the stage as well. If anybody wants to do that. Okay. No problem there. So what do we mean by decentralized credit union? What a great question. So the first thing that you guys should understand is what credit is. And if you want to, if you really want to, um, if you really want to boil this down into the Paleolithic um, society our ancestors lived in, when we would even do things like conversate with each other. So, for instance, if if we were sitting around a table as opposed to um, being connected via Discord right now, and I was going to ask somebody a question, and they either answered the question or they just stared at me in silence, what I'm doing right there internally is I'm assigning credibility to that person. Does that make sense? So if it was just me and Forker and I said, how's everything going Forker? And Forker said, it's not bad. How about yourself? Right? So the first thing I did by interacting with them is I took a risk of energy, right? By in fact, asking somebody and in they in turn responded, right? This is actually, um, I guess in what, in, 
in tech, you would call this latency, right? You would call this ping, right? And um, ping, when ping is low, it means it has a really, really high response rate, right? Like when ping is low, that means people are very, very responsive. So when you are doing that for information, it's the same thing as credit. Does that make sense? How responsive is this other party? You can assign credibility to that person based on how they respond. And it's the same way with ping. And it's actually the same way with credit. It's the same way with finance. So when we evolve that concept and we assign credibility, meaning let's say I was talking to two people at a table and I asked them both how they were doing. One of them said, not bad. How about yourself? And the other one said nothing. The other one just stared at me blankly. I am perhaps going to maybe ask them again, assuming they misheard me. But if they continue to stare at me blankly, meaning I'm not getting response from the second person, what am I going to do? I'm going to keep talking to the first person. I'm going to keep talking to the first person who's responding to me. Does that make sense to you guys? I hope that makes sense to you guys. Okay. Um, and it's through there that we meet both myself and the other person that's responding to me. We are subconsciously assigning each other credibility, which is in fact credit. Okay. And it's just information credit. It's not financial credit here. It's just the fact that, oh, if I talk to this person, they also talk back to me. Does that make sense? Whereas neither of us have that level of credibility or credit assigned to the third person at the table who does not talk, right? Or should I say does not respond? So when it comes to credit, when it comes to credit, there are two major parameters. Does anybody here know what the parameters of credit are as they are uh, analyzed in finance? The two, like the two most, the two ultimate parameters. Okay, I'll tell you guys. The first one is credit limit. And the second one is credit worthiness, okay? So credit limit is the analog and it is the how much question and credit worthiness, this is a digital and this is a yes or no. And by analog, I mean that it is a uh, zero to, you know, another number value. Like it's a, it can be any number of values, but credit worthiness is a digital, meaning it's a zero or a one. And therefore it's a yes or a no question. Does that make sense? So consider a boardroom. Consider a, consider a boardroom, consider a boardroom as a, um, as a line, as a socialized line of credit. I should call it a social, right? a social line of credit or an aggregate or an aggregate line of credit. What is it determining? When TWAP is above 1.01, the boardroom is determining the volume, which I determining the system to be credit worthy. And it issues a line of credit in the form of a print. Okay. When TWA is less than 1.01, the boardroom does not deem the system to be credit worthy. Does that make sense to all of you guys? Or at least to a few of you? Am I planning to deactivate the bot because some investors are exploiting the low price of the stocks? Probably not. Yeah, I don't know how. Yeah, no, I'm, I, I don't. Um, I don't know which bots you refer to. Do you mean like sandwich bots? I actually don't even know how to do that. Um, believe it or not, no. Because I would much rather during phase one, the investors figure out how to um, transact with smaller amounts. 
So the thing about bots is that bots get baited in when investors are doing, when they're throwing their whole bag into things. So I would much rather the bots be there as almost like a natural speed limit. Does that make sense? It might not make sense. Uh, okay, sandwich bots aren't going to sandwich a transaction unless they can uh, justify the risk of front running it, as it were. Does that make sense? Because they have to do things like pay for priority gas, as well as um, you know the risk of other front running, the, the risk of other sandwich bots being involved in this rat race. Does that make sense? So, so the people running those types of bots, they have their own cost benefit analysis. So the best way to uh, the best way to avoid problems caused by them is to actually train the investors in during phase one to use less money because if the transactions are too sm are uh, are small, um, then these bots just don't show up at all, you know. Or if they do, they're literally uh, they're only there based on how much slippage is dialed in, right? Now, if you're referring to arbitrage bots, like arbitrage bot to me is just another transactor. Yeah, there's another person making a transaction. I, there's no even, in my opinion, there's no reason in even treating them like they're different than a regular investor. Yeah. Um, that would be like Vitalik Buterin saying that arbitrage bots are causing problems for Ethereum. Um, if you want to actually know more about that right there, arbitrage bots, I want you to consider, before I keep going to the credit union, let's actually let's do something a little bit more fundamental to econ. I want you guys to consider going to a grocery store and buying a carrot, okay? Are you guys familiar with the concept of a grocery store and the concept of a carrot? So when you buy a carrot from a grocery store or when you buy a bag of carrots from the grocery store, the grocery store turns around and arbitrages those carrots with the farmer that grew them. Does that make sense? The grocery store performing this transaction with the farmer that grew them does not rob you of the value of your carrots because the value of your carrots was in your mind based on what you agreed to when you clicked the swap button. So whatever the swap told you you were getting, that's what you agreed to. So buyer's remorse is not the same thing as a robbery. People think that like, oh, now that I, now that, you know, somebody back on the transaction, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Like, oh my, yeah. Don't even get me started about the employees of the grocery store. Um, you know, they have to eat food as well. Like, what, how is this even, you know, how are these Ponzi schemes sustaining themselves? <laughs> yeah. So yeah, like arbitrage is something that I really wish all of you guys had learned about before you, you came to DeFi. I really wish that all DeFi investors knew the word arbitrage and understood it before they got here. Because learning about arbitrage, learning about arbitrage in DeFi is like, uh, I don't even know how to describe this. It's like, it's, it's literally like Plato's allegory of the cave. It's like, how are you, how, how on earth did you arrive at this conclusion about arbitrage? Because arbitrage is actually the most mundane transaction. It's like the most mundane thing as far as like market activity. So bots must stay active to, in order to encourage new investors. Uh, believe it or not, no, 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 no. Bots need to stay active. Um, by the way, which bots? Do you, mean, do you mean sandwich bots or do you mean arbitrage bots? Because arguably, I'm just considering them uh, a element of the uh, ecosystem, both of them, to be honest. Like I'm not running bots myself, I'll tell you that. Like I don't run bots. Yeah, I don't think of this as... Um, I think of this as something that is kind of would be ridiculous. Like if, if Fide was running an arbitrage bot, uh, that kind of completely defeats the purpose of uh, creating better instruments in liquidity. You know, right? I don't know. It, it, it would be like, um, fuck, man. It would be like a professional... Um, I can't even think of the fucking allegory here. Yeah. yeah it, it would be ridiculous to have that as part of your business model because you're like, you're transacting with yourself. It's like, well, I guess like, am I, am I, yeah, it's, uh, and again, again, most people don't understand that markets have bi-directionality and most, by the way, most of the time, I want you guys to know this. 
most of the time crypto markets move sideways Did you guys know that most of the time that crypto markets move sideways the reason we think that crypto markets you know uh rocket and plummet is because rocketing and plummeting have higher uh higher amounts of impact into our emotional state and therefore our memory records those events better but the actual reality for those of you who don't know is that crypto markets move sideways most of the time the reason you think that crypto rockets and plummets is because it was a more emotional event but like by the numbers crypto is majority a sideways market yeah exactly yeah it's a spread to trade i mean Forker, we're going to uh, stuff like that, again, is is not. And of course, imagine imagine the founders of Robin Hood, you know, trading on Robin Hood. Like, I mean, I like do, are you are you not managing other things right now? Does that make sense? It's like, why would you? Yeah, anyway, but people don't think like that. And again, this goes back to a lot of devs in DeFi not knowing what their job is. Like they do not know what their job is, and therefore they end up um, operating their platforms like shit. I'll just be honest with you there. Uh, okay, going back to this other question. Yeah, and again, by the way, yeah, that's not even how arbitrage bots work, siphoning liquidity. They actually bring you liquidity. Arbitrage bots bring you liquidity. <laughs> that, 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 the, the perception around arbitrage is... Um, yeah like i'm i'm gonna pay my own fee like i guess so yeah oh yeah i mean if they're if they're accessing the 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 mempool um but mempool would also be like that's a technically a sandwich bot is also bringing you liquidity because he's giving you transaction volume yeah that, that, that's what i mean like i don't know um the, the the sandwich bot arguably increases transaction volume too um, but so bots must stay active. The answer to your question is I just expect that bots will be active all the time because they always are. Uh, but it's literally like saying, um, yeah, I, I'm going to have to do an entire video series on bots because I think a lot of people have a lot of misconceptions about what they actually do to the economics of DeFi and whether or not they're neutral or beneficial or malicious and it's um understanding the way to view and view uh economics through the right lens of abs abstraction uh through the right lens of focality perhaps is the right word i'm looking for um can help you decipher this but arbitrage whether that's done by yeah arbitrage is like a very mundane type of activity and literally the entire world economy is kind of driven by it. And it's, uh, it's actually not that impressive or interesting, but in DeFi, the level of illiteracy is so high that people think arbitrage is what's causing ecosystems to collapse. It's, it's actually kind of what sustains ecosystems. But um, the bots are run then act on price action transaction until they are shut down. Yeah, yeah, for sure. But yeah, those also, those also bring you liquidity. Yeah. If they, if they, if they make a transaction on your LP, they are bringing liquidity. Yeah. Cause those same bots are going to come to you the other direction as well. Yeah. So like, and at the same time, it's like, what, what will be the point of that? Uh, again, it's like, Imagine somebody owns a landscaping company and they employ tons of people to cut grass. Are they also going to cut their own lawn? Do you know what I mean? Like that's, that's what I feel like I would be accused of if somebody thought I'm running arbitrage bots. I'm like, no, no, no. I kind of provide those opportunities for other people. I don't need to actually do it myself. Anyway, that's just, yeah, M more on that later. But um, I think that a lot of misconceptions around bots Oh, yeah, you're right. You know what, Timas? That's a great question. And uh, Timas, I want you to know we do uh, plan on updating the websites um, along, with, um, along with the social media links. Yes, because I know that the social media links are still not correct. Okay, I'm going to let you guys know something. We had some devs during this project. Um, some devs, we had some dev attrition. You guys know what attrition is?
attrition. I'm going to write that in the big top for you guys. By the way, this dev attrition did cause a lot of the delay, okay? But I'm not mad at anybody. Well, they weren't terminations. It was more like they, they literally were juggling this project along with other things in their life. And then eventually they either, uh, they, they themselves were dealing with their own adversity in getting this stuff to the finish line. And we had to have a lot of other, we had to have a lot of new devs step up to take over where old devs uh, no longer had the availability. And by the way, I would say arguably over two months of delays, over two months of delays just so far have happened because of attrition. I don't know if you guys know that right now. And it's not because like, oh, there was just nothing happening. It's because there needed to be work redone. Some work is like, um, for instance, parts of the boardroom, no, sorry, parts of the dashboard. You guys know the dashboard? Parts of the dashboard are like not inside our own GitHub because they were built and hosted uh, in a uh, in a devs in a devs um, in their own GitHub in their own in their own hosting. They were actually paying for their own hosting, which they didn't need to do, but they were doing it for testing, and it kind of remained that way. And then we lost access to that hosting. So all of our dashboards, we actually need to migrate the hosting of it, and that's why we haven't deployed them on Frozen Tomb and Snow Tomb. This is kind of embarrassing, to be honest. It's embarrassing, but at the same time, we have a solution and we're working towards it. And that's, we are definitely going to succeed at it. Um, but it's just been this one gigantic um, crusade for me. For those of you who don't know, the original PyroSwap designs were actually started off in July of last year. So this is like month 14 for me in this project. I know you guys didn't really learn about it until November or December. But this is already over a year for me. Um, I, um, I am actually, what I do know is that once we're in beta and once we're in phase one, we will have momentum. I don't think it will take as long to get to phase five as it did to get to phase one. Does that make sense? I think we could get to phase five in less time than it took to get to phase one. But once we have momentum, and we'll really start to get momentum in phase two, by the way. Um, once we have that kind of momentum, we'll be able to rapidly roll stuff out. Uh, and I mean, there's, if it's not clear, there's, there's five phases so far of planned stuff for PyroSwap. And I can get more into that once we're in open beta. Hope that answers your question, um, and then and then some. But yeah, as far as bots goes, um, I'm not personally running bots. I I expect that bots will operate because of a concept called Zugzwang. Do you guys know what the word Zugzwang means? Who here has heard the Fithian use in 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 the vocabulary that is Fithianism? Who here has heard Zugzwang get used? Okay, I will in fact pull up a screenshot of what of what pops up from a uh, a search for Zugzwang definition. So, so in Fideanism, we do not we do not use the actual chess uh, definition, but we use the basic concept compulsory move. So in DeFi, the uh, the hedonistic marmoset exists in a state of zugzwang, whether whether they realize it or not. Here is how Zugzwang works. If the marmoset feels greed, feels greed, they will move towards something. If the marmoset feels fear, they will move away from it. 
Okay. So, so as far as these bots, like I just assume the bots are there. Like uh, they're just part of the layer of this, of this environment. Um, the bots, they don't, uh, while they do perhaps cause trouble, they do not in fact undermine the system. Um, if they're using like mempool stuff, they are in fact undermining the integrity of the chain. But what's good about this is that you can actually eliminate this by causing more people to be invested in maintaining the integrity of the chain. What I, what I mean by that is the people who validate with a node or they're perhaps they, uh, they're, mining, they're mining the fucking blocks, as it were, they're invested in maintaining the integrity of the chain. In fact, they're rewarded for maintaining the integrity of the chain. Uh, if, if MEV things are happening where they are in fact selling private mempool access or they are in fact, uh, they are running their own MEV bot, this is kind of like, it's the same thing as, as me running a bot. It's like, why on earth would I be undermining the chain that I am in fact proving is, uh, that, like why, why would I be kind of corrupting the integrity of a chain that I have my hardware invested in maintaining? Does that make sense? It's like, imagine like putting gas in your own car and then like siphoning it out later to like steal from yourself. Does that make sense? Do you get what I'm saying? Like this is, this is kind of what people are accused of. It's like, oh, well, technically they could steal from this. It's like, well, they're also throwing gas money in the, in the tank as well. Does that make sense? Like if it's like they're all chipping in for gas, but they're also going to steal a little gas as well for themselves. I, it, if, if all of the people doing this will happen, the chain will collapse. And I hope they realize that. I don't think, I think they do realize that because it so far hasn't happened. I don't know of any chain that MEV or private mempool access got so ridiculous that effectively the ecosystem collapsed because nobody was invested in uh, too much of that and people will stop mining. People will stop validating. Anyway, when I say Marmoset, I mean DeFi investor, by the way. So like, because DeFi investors are in a state of Zugzwang all the time, you can expect them to run these little Zugzwang bots. If they feel greed, they'll move towards it. Here's the good news about bots. Bots don't always win. Do you know why bots don't always win? It's because they're not the only person running that bot. There's in fact, dozens of people playing this same game. Bots are people who actually are trying to find these micro pennies to scrape together because they don't have uh, they don't have long time preference. They're trying to make instant transactions that happen within a single block, right? Because they don't have the risk appetite to have higher levels of exposure. This is fine. Like this is, I have my risk appetite or rather my time preference is so long. I find that behavior laughable. So like, I don't personally think it undermines anything because it's through time. It's through, it's through the, um, it's through the variegation of time preference that you can even make a market of financial instruments self-sustain itself. And I, I think that the time value of money and money value of time is a concept that kind of boggles people's brains. But I hope in the future I'm able to provide a lot more educational content about illuminating that for you guys, um, because arbitrage is mundane and it is very uh, kind of necessary for like all of regular economics. So. You should not think of arbitrage as like some sort of tapeworm or some sort of leech. They're just, in fact, like kind of keeping the wheels moving. Um, if, if you, if, if the grocery store was not buying carrots from the farmer, you wouldn't have carrots for yourself, you know? So like the, the, the fact that in real life, you don't notice, you wouldn't notice that that's happening but on the blockchain, the, the people notice it's happening and they think they're getting robbed. It's like, oh, are you telling me that the grocery store's profit margin allowed for them to, you know, resupply carrots while also paying their employees and themselves? It's like, well, yeah, that's if they didn't have that level of profit incentive, they would not be running that grocery store. And uh, you would need to go get carrots all on your own. Um. I'm actually going to, uh, I have some pieces of writing prepared for you guys specifically on the, 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 the grocery store metaphor 
because there's a lot of things that your money goes towards in a grocery store when you buy carrots from it. And I actually have a, I have that kind of split out. More on that later. Okay, do you guys want me to go back to talking about the decentralized credit union? Mr. Urten, you're completely correct. Uh, and I definitely will. And I definitely will because it's, it's, um, it's not so much that like I think sandwich bots are good, right? Sandwich bots are deliberately like, um, they, are little, they are parasitic, right? But the, pro- the point is, is that first of all, there, there are things like um, uh, aggregators, right? Are you, are you familiar with DEX aggregators like Bogged? So aggregators are actually ways that you can mitigate uh, the things that a, um, that, a, that a sandwich bot can get from you. Does that make sense? I use aggregators. Um, PyreSwap itself will not have its own aggregator. Rather, it's not planned to have one. But I definitely think that uh, aggregators like Bogged will get linked up with PyreSwap eventually. So we'll do that probably around phase three if it doesn't happen naturally. Does that make sense? Uh, we're using the same LP contracts as everybody else. So I think that we'll end up getting listed on aggregators because we should have transaction volume. Uh, but yeah, that is that is definitely true. Um, and it's not, that, it's not that I want you to think that these bots are blessings, but rather I want you to understand that there is a silver lining to every cloud. And it's from those silver linings that there, there actually can be a social good achieved by these bots. And I will go into that more. Um, arbitrage bots, for instance, uh, they can also provide price support and price resistance. Does that make sense? So if you ever have been watching a DeFi project and you watched, oh shit, a gigantic red candle happened. Well, believe it or not, if that liquidity was spread out into more pairs, arbitrage bots would actually repair those red candles with some green candles. And arguably, they would in fact also repair gigantic green candles with red ones as well. Um, Arbitrage bots in this behavior, they end up actually making the coin a little bit more stable, not stable, uh, a little bit more rigid and a little bit more uh, durable. I guess durability would be what I would think. Price durability is probably what I'm thinking of. So arbitrage bots there can actually provide durability. And Mr. Urten, I want you to know, there is um, there is something else I could say here as well. Fivianism, which is effectively the name of this type of school of thinking, it looks like Fivianism is correct. And if Fivianism is correct, I'm actually going to do, do, uh, blah. I'm going to produce a series of videos on everywhere uh, where I differentiate in my viewpoint from DeFi conventionalism. So DeFi conventionalism across the board, um, they have focuses on different things and they focus more on the infrastructure where I focus on the instrument. They focus on being anti-friction and I focus on being pro-fulcrum. Um, and of course, about the bots, like arbitrage bots specifically, I think are in fact um, harmless and necessary, but uh, because of DeFi conventionalism, they are viewed as back runners, right? They call them back runners which is um, kind of hilarious. But the fact of the matter is, is um, it is not, it is not robbing somebody to do arbitrage based on price impact. Rather, they are in fact bringing both of the markets to health. Um, And there are a bunch of things about liquidity management in DeFi that's not being looked at either. Uh, For instance, DeFi conventionalism, they look at something in the, um, within the anatomy of a hyperbola. Here, I'll show you this. I'll paste these two images over here. So if you're not familiar with what I just posted in the big top, uh, quantity asset A and quantity asset B, that is actually a uh, graphical representation of the constant product formula. And if you're not aware, the constant product formula is a hyperbola um, that, um, that asymptotically approaches, or should I say it approaches the asymptotes of uh, its X and Y axis. And it never, in fact, crosses them. It never crosses them, right? It always approaches, but never crosses them. Now, what you might not realize is the intersection of the two green lines, meaning A tokens sold, B tokens bought. If you notice, 
there is a right angle formed at that intersection. And they don't really point it out. They don't really highlight what that intersection is. But in the anatomy of a hyperbola, that is called its focus. Do you guys see on the left image, the dot pointed out and labeled as focus? Do you guys see focus there in the first image? It's actually in two places. Anyway, I hope you do. If you don't, I will end up doing this type of content much later. Uh, Fideanism, instead of focusing on the focus, we focus on the vertex in liquidity because it's in the vertex that you can actually determine the, um, the financial instrument value of liquidity in general. Because if you only look at the focus, you're not really getting, um, you're not really getting like a good view of the dynamic behavior of an LP instrument. And that is something that's going to be unique to PyroSwap as well in phase two. Um, I am going to take a quick break, but I will come back and I'll keep, I'll keep talking about decentralized credit union if nobody has a question. Um, but you're completely correct. I recognize that PyroSwap, by the way, Mr. Ertan and Timas, um, I needed, before I was going to talk shit about anybody, whether that's DeFi conventionalism or... Uh, literally anybody else in DeFi, I needed to put up or shut up, okay? I needed to prove that my design principles were, were, uh, were functional and even superior to, um, to literally everybody else in DeFi. And that is why PyroSwap kind of put me into a um, silence for a good six months here, right? I, you, you guys have not heard from me a lot in 2023, not like you guys used to hear from me in 2022. I needed to prove that I wasn't a crazy person. Does that make sense? Because what I was looking at 99%, maybe, maybe not 99, but 90% of people could not see. And it made me think more and more that I might be hallucinating. I'm not lying to you. I literally doubted my own sanity. And I thought perhaps that I was imagining these things. And this caused me to scrutinize PyroSwap's design. Like I needed to scrutinize this 100 I probably scrutinized it 600 times before I even debuted it internally to the circus. And I kept finding, I kept seeing that I wasn't wrong. And at least in principle, I wasn't wrong. And what was really going to determine whether or not these principles were worth a fucking damn is if we could also build with these principles and actually make something, right? Make something and perhaps evolve something from a Ponzi scheme to actually being a uh, a microcosm of an economy in, in DeFi. And it looks more and more like I'm correct. So this is the most vindicating moment of my life. And I do realize that I am actually causing an ideal, PyroSwap is causing an ideological schism in DeFi, a schism. So if you guys remember like the Protestant Reformation or things like that, we are ideologically schisming DeFi and, um, we are, we are separating from, from people like Paradigm XYZ. They're the ones who wrote most about MEV and IL. Um, Bancor Exchange, uh, Nate Hindeman is the guy who invented the term IL. Do you guys know who Nate Hindeman is? So I am, I as five, or as my real name is Philip Merzaglocki, I am ideologically rejecting literally all all, all principles of DeFi written up to before me. Like I am, um, I, am, I am literally making that big of a bet. And the thing is right now, only 10 of you guys are in my audience. This looks like I win. This looks like I win. And if I win, then um, you'll remember coming to this AMA for a long time, I think. <laughs> but let me, let me take a quick hydration break and then I co I'll come back and I'll do... 40 minutes just on talking about credit unions and how we have designed a decentralized one. Um, give me just a few minutes. I'll be right back.
Okay, so I'm back, and um, I guess I'll just finish this out at around the two-hour mark. Um, so we have about 40 minutes left, and I can just talk about decentralized credit unions. Um, and, okay, the reason this is decentralized is because this is, in fact, a system where there is not a single investor or actor in charge. In fact, who becomes in charge of these credit unions is whoever kind of gets majority influence, sway, or control over the boardroom. And this is part of the game fi of playing for the Knights. Now, believe it or not, you might think, oh, but wouldn't that be the Senior Circus um, themselves? Wouldn't you guys be the biggest player? Not necessarily true. We are, in fact, capped at, uh, we are internally capped at 15% of the share coin, like our quota goal, which we actually need to acquire via, um, we need to acquire that more later, is 15% of the boardroom. And we will have that all staked in our own boardroom, right? Along with you guys, right? But you guys make up 85% and we're only 15. So believe it or not, the, the people in the boardroom ideally do not work against each other, but actually work to w work with each other. There is in fact a layer of game theory and I arguably will have to uh, draw a matrix for this. But the way that the boardroom is now organized involves another, another layer of game theory. Because for those of you who don't remember, Remember back in the day when you would get a print and everybody would basically just front run each other to dump it because if you were the last one selling your print, you're effectively getting the lowest price for it. Everybody else in front of you, they fucking got the highest price for it. Does that make sense? Does anybody remember that from back when boardrooms were printing? Does that sound familiar to anybody? Yeah. Okay. So point being there. Yeah, point. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Ocean Boy. Um, point being there is that while those transactions are necessary, because this is a seniorage protocol and it is through seniorage, meaning it is through uh, taking profit from those prints that you're able to return to beg. What this actually might do do for you is um, what this actually might do for you is. Um, it might pit you against the other people in the boardroom. Does that make sense? Because you're now in a unspoken contest that you want to sell before everybody else does. And that way you're always getting, you're just squeezing out a few extra nickels from that print uh, per coin for, uh, over everybody else. So let me go back to credit and uh, credit limit and credit worthiness. So credit worthiness, does everybody understand me when I talk about credit worthiness being TWAP, uh, TWAP, a, t a time weighted average price of 1.01. .01. When the time weighted average price is 1.01 .01 or higher, the system is deemed credit worthy and a line of credit is extended in the form of a print. Does that make sense? And however many that is, however, however many of those coins are in circulation or in existence, that is a social volume of credit. Okay, I'm going to write that word. A social volume of credit. And by the way, if you're not aware of a large fraction of the money circulating in the United States is also credit. Does that make sense? It is also credit. Did you got, are you guys aware of this? Probably in Europe as well. I don't know for sure, but the, uh, you might be, in fact, let me find that out right now. Oh, okay, so uh, possibly ten percent, or I actually I can't figure out the number right now, but anyway. There, uh, the amount of credit circulating, the amount of credit in the, in the American economy is in the trillions, put it that way. So this, these currencies, let's say we're talking about 2 ohm, 3 ohm, and Z ohm. These are social credit volumes. 
And basically speaking is the boardrooms themselves will determine whether this credit line gets extended via a print, right? Whenever you're above 1.01, the credit line will get extended. And it is how you manage, it is how the investors manage this, this line of credit that will determine whether or not their line of credit increases or decreases, okay? And that's the same way it works in real life too. Do you guys understand what I'm saying? Debt to income ratio, have you guys ever heard of that before? So your ability to have, uh, your ability to look credible uh, via how much you manage of your own credit will actually determine whether or not that credit card company or whatever will give you an extension in credit. Has everybody, does everybody know what I'm talking about? Who here has a, I'm assuming, you know, at least half of you are familiar with a credit card or a line of credit. Okay, I'm just gonna assume you guys have a gist of it. We're gonna keep going. Um, Mr. Urtan, yeah, 18 days max is definitely a good number. I doubt it'll even go over 14 days. Yeah, cool. yeah, and then of course, the open beta could even be like 90 days. And the open beta, by the way, is like everybody can play. Does that make sense? So open beta is like most of phase one for sure. Um, and um, yeah, o open beta is when you'll see the majority of the return on investment too. So open beta is when you'll see uh, 0.4 TWAPs get hit. So that's also where the majority of the, the multiplication is going to happen. Um, so yeah, the, the, uh, closed beta should be like less than two weeks. Open beta should be, uh, it could be the, the, the rest of 2023 as it were, which is fine because that's, that will be very, very, um, that'll be a great way to end the year. And for those of you who don't know, um, the, uh, the aesthetic of Pyre Swap is very, very aligned with Halloween, you know, for those of you who don't know, you know. Uh, we're going to have, it, it, it's a, it's a great, it'll be great to have this going during Halloween and DeFi. I'll tell you that it'll be really good because it just, the whole thing will look perfect. It'll truly look like some Halloween type DeFi. Um, anyway. Yeah, exactly. So that's, that's a silver lining there, <laughs> but Okay, so now we have credit worthiness. Does everybody understand me metaphorically where I'm saying boardrooms are determining credit worthiness of the, the system based on TWAP? Meaning right now, because TWAPs are low, the boardroom is not interested in extending the line of credit. Does everybody understand what I'm saying here? But if the TWAP was higher, the, uh, the, the behavior of the investors is analyze in a way that the boardroom continues to believe they are credit worthy. Does that make sense? So now we have the other concept. Credit worthiness is determined by what? Credit worthiness is, yeah, above, above or below TWAP 101. This is the fucking, this is the question, right? Now we have credit limit. Okay. So who here knows about the word expansion rate? Who here knows what the word expansion rate? Who here knows what expansion rate means um, with respect to a, uh, a tomb fork? Who here knows what expansion rate is? Thirty-three <laughs> percent. Uh, that is thirty-three percent is the uh, the the amount that expansion rate is limited. Are the packs going to be equalized? The packs. What do you mean by the packs, sir? Oh, the pegs. Do you mean the pegs?
Okay. Yes. So, um, great question. Uh, uh, yes, the answer is yes. So that will definitely happen in the closed beta. So we will uh, we will set the new pegs up in closed beta for sure. And basically, they'll be the same way that I've announced them before. We haven't changed those. Uh, it'll pretty much all three peg coins on that chain will have a one to ten to one hundred ratio. Uh, the one difference to that is is BNB, which will actually be one thousand one hundred and ten. Sorry, it's. Um, but yeah, all three of the coins on that chain will have a factor of 10 between, um, their neighbors, so to speak. And that's just for a little bit of variety, but yeah, we will be doing that during closed beta. So the way that I've, the way that I've talked about it before, that will continue to be the goal there. And, uh, th those pegs will be permanent. We won't change them. And, uh, they will, of course, help the whole thing function as well. So we're, we are going to be very permanent with the pegs, and then we're going to be very, very permanent with expansion rates. So what expansion rate actually is, what expansion rate actually is, and is, um, it is what, what Wake Sessions is talking about is how expansion rate is limited via bonds. But what expansion rate actually is, and here I will pull up a website called snowtrace.io. And what we'll do is we'll look for a token called Frozen Tomb. Right, so we have this right here. We have, I'm gonna post it in the big top, by the way. I've been using the big top for images. Um, so you'll see here, Frozen Tomb is, uh, we have 18,664.7, right? So we have about 18,000 and two thirds, okay? Um, and what this means, by the way, what this means is um, the expansion rate of the boardroom is looking at this number which is, by the way, total supply, and then multiplying it by a percentage. That percentage is expansion rate, and it is a, um, it is, uh, for, 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 if you guys aren't aware, it will be 2%, 3%, and, um, and 4% nominally between the three boardrooms. Now, what can affect these is what Wake Sessions was saying. Uh, what can affect these is the bonds in circulation. And the, the, the bonds being in circulation will reduce these, um, these expansion rates. And they will, in fact, keep a certain amount of the peg coin uh, inside the treasury for the purpose of people who want to redeem bonds. Okay. No, no problem, Charlotte. Yeah, that's not a problem at all. Okay. So, effectively speaking, then what becomes the credit limit? Credit limit is expansion rate times total supply. So for, for Frozen Tomb's case right here, if Frozen Tomb, if Frozen Tomb was at peg, the boardroom would determine its, uh, its credit limit would be 2% times 18,667. We'll just say, we'll just say it's around that number. So if we take that number, 18,664, and we multiply it by this number, we now have 373.294 frozen tomb as a credit limit extension. And a credit limit extension is what? And by the way, that's actually that is actually um, that is actually a uh, daily that is actually a daily um, expansion rate. So per epoch, you divide it by four. Does everyone understand what I mean by that? 
So if you were going to be above 1.01 for an entire day, meaning four epochs, 373.294 frozen tomb would expand as a credit limit. Believe it or not, it would actually be a little bit faster than that because they would um, they would actually compound, right? But let's say we're going to divide that number by four and you end up with 93, which is 93.3235, right? So 93.3235 93 frozen tomb is printed in the epoch that TWAP is above 1.01 and total supply is 18,000. Does everybody understand the numbers that I am, uh, is everybody following my math here? Okay. Great, 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 great. Okay, so I want you guys to take into consideration what would happen, what would happen if Frozen Tomb was printed and nobody, nobody claimed it and nobody sold it. Meaning, what would happen? What would happen to the price? Honestly, I would say it stays the same. Yeah. Yeah, I don't, I don't really like if nobody's transacting, nobody claims it and nobody's sell selling it. Right? So all of the actual new frozen tomb is just remaining there in the boardroom. Does that make sense? But let's say, that, let's say there's still like 700 guys in there, right? I, I see Timos has his eyeballs. Timos, do you have a, do you have a, am I pronouncing your name correctly? Timus? I have no idea. Anyway, what would happen? What would happen to frozen tomb printed? Oh, no, for sure. And I know that there's actually other variable things that could happen to frozen tomb, right? Like other random things could change its price, but Let's think about just the stuff that was printed. If nobody claimed it and nobody sold it, and let's say there was no other illiquid frozen tomb waiting in somebody's fucking pocket, um, we would probably assume that frozen tomb's price would stay the same. And, and TMOS, if frozen tomb's price is going to stay the same, what's going to happen next, next epoch? Do you have a guess? Does anybody have a guess? What would happen next epoch if the price is the same, nobody claims it and nobody sells it? It's not a, it's not a trick question. It's a very simple question. Yeah. Oh, for sure. But again, assume that nothing, none of that happens. It, it definitely, it definitely depends on people claiming. But like, assume that nobody claims it. It's just piled up there and it's waiting. Nothing. Okay. And if nothing happens, then the, then the next epoch is going to elapse right five hours 59 minutes will go by and then the next epoch will transpire and then what will happen what happens in the next epoch transpiration if prices remain the same meaning above pay nobody has a guess it's not that hard it prints again that's what happens it will print again Okay, does that make sense, everybody? It will print again. But here is the thing. Here's the thing that is not immediately obvious. This next print, this next print is larger than the previous one. 
Does that make sense? Who here can explain why this next print is also is larger than the previous one? No, no, the expansion rates are like, they have locked in. We're not making them variable. The only thing that changes the expansion rate is if people bond. And the thing is, they're not going to be able to bond because we're above peg. Expansion rate will be a 2% for the rest of time. The only thing that changes the expansion rate is if users bond. But it'll be, it'll be 2% and whatever the, the drop-off is there from bonds. But the expansion rate will be the same because we're not going below peg. So we'll have a print, but there's another thing that's going to happen. What, what, what are people not noticing about the second print immediately? What's not immediately obvious about the second print? And that's probably a terrible question to ask. So I'll just tell you guys, this second print is actually larger. This is a, the second print is larger than the first one. Who here can explain why it's larger? It's not that much larger. Go on, take a shot. I don't yell at people if they're wrong. Come on. I, I recognize sometimes that my questions are like not phrased clearly. No, nothing to do with the bonds. Nothing to do with the bonds. It is in fact only, yeah, okay. Why is the second print larger than the first one? Yeah, in this scenario, when nobody, nobody claimed, nobody claimed after, after print number one, why is print number two larger than print number one? Total supply, indeed. Yep, correct, correct. Total supply has now gone up. Does that make sense, everybody? And if total supply has now gone up, credit limit is based on what again? What are the two, what are the two variables of credit limit? Yep, it's total, it's expansion rate times total supply, but yes. So expansion rate stays the same and total supply goes up. Therefore, print is actually larger. Does that make sense, everybody? Now what happens, now what happens to the price of the share coins over time if the prints keep getting larger? And this, by the way, and this is not a like direct domino effect rather this is the uh this is the uh i guess you can say the um this is the um this is the perception that the market will arrive at um via brownian motion i don't fuck do i speak english anymore i'm i can't exp all right yeah this is not a direct domino effect, but rather if the, if the prints keep getting larger, what's going to happen to the price of the share coin? Quite, Charlotte, correct. Quite. And do you know why price is going to go up? Because the way that APR, the way that return on investment is measured in the boardroom UI is based on a dollar against dollar return um, on the price of the share coin. So if DeFi investors or DGENs, as it were, if they see a, you know, they want to see that 1% daily, as it were, if they're seeing that 1% daily and the, and the prints keep getting larger, that has to be a proportional ratio from the price of the, the print to the price of the, sorry, not the price of the print, but the total value, the total dollar value, the total numerator value of the print against the price of all the share coins taken cited. 
Does that make sense? So, if the if the okay, if the prints keep getting larger, if the prints keep getting larger, and the price of the share coin continues to go up, what will happen if prints keep getting smaller? And by the way, does anyone here understand what would happen if prints got smaller? Does anyone know how prints would even... Um, I should actually explain this one a little bit better. Okay. Now, in the scenario, let's go back to let's go back to the scenario. Let's go back to the scenario where nobody claimed and nobody sold. In this version, everyone claims and everyone sells. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna just ask the whole thing uh, a little bit more. I'm going to illuminate it a little bit more clearly. Okay. So everyone claims and everyone sells. What happens to the price of the peg coin and its T walk? Let's say T walk is exactly 1.01. Yeah, lower, of course. Lower. In fact, now that it's lower, an epoch is going to go by, and what are what is now going to be uh, the first thing that's going to happen after the next epoch is that bonds will be available. So bonds being available, um, that could affect the expansion rate, but not not really permanently. So I would almost argue that you should not even think about bonds in this scenario. So you don't need to think about bonds in this scenario at all. But what will happen if it goes below 0 0.80 TWAP? So the peg coin is going to go lower. And um, let's say that liquidity is going to be super tight because, by the way, it might be. Uh, let's say it goes after one print, it goes all the way to 0 0.75 TWAP. 0 0.75 TWAP is where it's at. Now, what's going to happen here at the next epoch? It's not the expansion rate, no. But you're close. What does a me do? Yeah, the expansion rate could contract if the bonds get used. But let's assume that let's for the sake of the scenario, let's assume that bonds are not getting used. Granted, they, uh, bonds will be in liquidity, by the way. So if you guys haven't heard me say that, we will be deploying bonds in liquidity pairs on fucking PyreSwap because it actually makes it actually makes the bonds useful. Um, no, 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 no. No, I'm not asking what happens with price. What does, what does a mead do to the peg 